All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody. This is uh, the town hall for students. Um, we're happy to have a, a lot of leadership and experts in the room for you to answer your questions today. And uh, we have a lineup um, that was uh, publicized with the, the invite. So we're gonna go through um, those, uh, the leaders are gonna provide comments um, in responding to questions that you guys have already uh, pre-submitted. But um, after we get through um, our speakers, we will go to a Q&A. Uh, just know our goal is to answer all your questions. If they don't get answered, here in this town hall today, um, look for your next green mail and uh, we will have answers to the questions that you've submitted that we don't cover in today's town hall. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to introduce Angela Lee. She is your president for the Undergraduate Student Government Association. Angela. Thank you, Rosie. Hi, Blazers. This is Angela. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I currently serve as the undergraduate student government president. I'd like to begin and say that I hear my peers when they bring up concerns pertaining to restrictions on student events, remote engagement, in-person class anxiety to shifts in on-campus dining. There are several key leaders on this call who will go in depth about their respective operations, but as a senior student and student leader, I recognize how these semi-new guidelines affects us socially and mentally. And although I myself undergo the same emotions as most students on the uncertainty that COVID and national labor shortages present us, USGA has dedicated members serving on several committees that target your financial, academic, social justice, and campus-based affairs. We have a continued resource, the USGA Textbook Award, for students with financial need needing a way to pay for college textbooks. The start of the, of the spring semester may be stressful, but affording classroom materials shouldn't. So those on this call interested, the application is due Friday and available on USGA's Instagram link tree. I'm happy to answer questions on USGA's end on how we can continue supporting students throughout the semester. And just thank you for your time and attention. And I'm gonna pass it along to Jasmine Benjamin. Hey everyone, good afternoon. My name is Jasmine. I am, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the president of the graduate student government. <laughs> So depending on how you're counting, we've been living in a pandemic for somewhere between two and three years. And at this point, most of us are pros at being students in these conditions. I know that two to three years is a long time, and I know that we're all exhausted. I definitely am. Wearing a mask, obsessively using hand sanitizer, and staying further than usual away from strangers is this really tiring and strange norm that we've come to know. And although I know it's not ideal to start yet another semester with masks, COVID tests, vaccinations, virtual events, and the like, I like to think of times like this in a positive sense. So many of you have likely heard of delayed gratification. You've maybe seen those videos of little kids where their parents tell them, I'll set 10 pieces of candy in front of you now, and I'll leave the room. And if you don't touch them when I come back, I'll give you 30 pieces of candy. So right now, we have the 10 pieces of candy in front of us. We certainly could go ahead and do what some other universities have tried and push the old normal, which would risk a massive spike in infections in both our campus and the greater Birmingham community and further contribute to the strain on our healthcare professionals and our healthcare system, not to mention putting numerous lives at risk. But that would prevent us from getting the 30 pieces of candy down the road, so to speak. That would keep us from maintaining in-person classes, going back to in-person student events, and it could even keep us from having an in-person commencement in the spring which I know a lot of us, grad student and undergrad student alike, are really looking forward to. I know that all of this is less than ideal. I know that we're all tired of Zoom, we're tired of masks, virtual events, et cetera. But the good thing is that you as students can help us get that 30 pieces of candy, the big prize. There's a couple of things you can do. You can wear a mask, whether it's a thick cloth mask or surgical mask or a KN95 mask. You can even stack them like I like to do. You can wear those indoors and not just when you're on campus, also when you're out around town in the grocery stores and so on. You can get vaccinated if you're medically able. And if you've already been fully vaccinated, you can get your booster shots. You can also trust that we have some of the most brilliant clinical and research minds in the country keeping an eye on things. 
and looking out for your best interests. And you'll hear from a lot of them today. And you can also, most importantly, continue doing what we've done so well for the past two to three years, and that's showing your Blazor spirit. As always, if any of our students need anything, I'm only an email away, and I'm happy to help as much as I can. Please stay safe, be responsible, and go Blazers. I will pass things along to President Watts now. Thank you very much. Well, let me add my welcome back to campus for the spring semester. And once again, we are in the midst of a COVID surge, this one Omicron. The good thing about Omicron is it's primarily an upper respiratory infection and not a lower respiratory infection, but it is highly contagious. For those who are vaccinated, it's generally either a mild upper respiratory infection like a cold or sometimes even asymptomatic. So we, know the tools to keep us safe and that's primary in all of our minds and that is masking and vaccination and making sure that you don't get exposed to someone else who does not have a mask and is infected or might be. So you'll hear from our team of leaders and experts um, why we have returned to campus. Some people ask why most people want to be back at campus we wouldn't do it if it's not safe. So we know how to manage this now. And it is likely that coronavirus will be with us for potentially a long time. And you'll hear from Dr. Judd and Dr. Morazzo about that. So I'm gonna turn it over now so that we can keep moving and answer your questions to Provost Pam Bedard. Pam. Good afternoon. It's really nice to see you all out there, and I'm so glad that you attended to get this wonderful information that we have to share with you about the decision-making process and the evidence that we've used to try to make those decisions. One of the things that we know is that student success is impacted by being in in-person classes, and we also know that being out of the classroom has a negative effect on student mental health, and so we don't want students to feel isolated. Uh, or depressed if we if we can do anything to help to address those kinds of issues. And so that's part of the decision making process that went into uh, having in person classes. We also know that we can adjust. Uh, we've already proven that we've been able to adjust when necessary. As Jasmine said, it's not our preference. Um, but we certainly know how to do it and we, we can do it again as it's necessary in order to keep making progress on your academic futures. This isn't new to us. Um, we, we have gone through it before. We even have more tools in our toolbox now with the vaccines and the high level of vaccinations on campus that can help us to continue to have in-person kinds of classrooms. And we're not alone. Uh, we know from an article in Inside Higher Ed that's titled Most Colleges Resume In-Person Classes, that the majority of higher ed institutions from a survey of 502 institutions are in person uh, this fall, this, this spring. And so it, most of the other campuses are also in person. If you look at the higher ed public institutions in Alabama, all of them are also in person, trying to provide that unique kind of very valuable experience for students. I wanna address a couple of the questions that came in. One of the questions, not surprisingly, is will there be a commencement like Jasmine mentioned too, we're, we're all looking forward to that. We were able to do that in December and will there be a spring break? And you'll hear some of the modeling from Dr. Judd in a little bit. And we're very optimistic that we're gonna be past the surge. Although, you know, we cannot predict what's coming next. So I can't promise, but I am very, hopeful that both of those will go forward as usual. One of the other questions was, why aren't we following the other models like at Emory? Emory is a private institution. Um, they delayed the return to campus. Other institutions, again, in Alabama did not do delays. And again, here are some of the factors. Somebody asked, what's, what is the determining factor? And it's not that easy. There are multiple factors that have to be taken into account. Our higher vaccination rates, our uh, mental health issues, our student success issues, that this is not just about how many people have been affected, but it's the severity of the infections with this new variant. So all of those factors went into making a decision about in-person instruction. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it along to Dr. Lisa Schwieber, who is the interim dean of the graduate school to speak to graduate student issues. 
Great, thank you, Dr. Benoit. And hello, everyone. Um, just great to, to see everyone out there. As we begin this new semester, I would really like for our graduate students, both our master's students and certainly our doctoral students, to know that we here in the graduate school well recognize the challenges that COVID has brought to your research and your training programs on, on a day-to-day -day level. But please know that we are here to support and help you in any way that we can. We have a terrific team in the graduate school to help with uh, resiliency and can help you continuing to be productive and striving on your, your career path. And that we really wish for you a, a very healthy and safe semester. I'll keep my comments brief because there are others here in the room that we need to hear from. And I'm gonna pass it off now to Dr. Jeannie Marazzo, who is the director of our infectious disease division. Thanks so much, Lisa. And uh, thanks for having me and good to be here. Sorry, we're um, in a virtual format, but um, that's the way it is. Um, as, as Jasmine so eloquently uh, stated before. So I'll just cover a couple of topics to try to make sure we're on the same page and also address a few comments and questions that we got in the submitted questions. So first of all, we've heard a little bit about the current epidemiology in the Omicron uh, wave. What we're seeing is just an unbelievable number of cases. If you look at all of the graphs in terms of case counts, um, it's being described as sort of this ice pick in terms of the rapidity with which it ascends. And then hopefully, very fingers crossed, as Dr. Uh, Judd is going to talk about in a minute, um, a pretty rapid decline in numbers of cases. That's what's been seen in South Africa. It's probably what is uh, happening in the United Kingdom. Um, but to get there, we are experiencing, I think, a lot of pain and discomfort. So. In terms of the severe consequences of Omicron, um, Dr. Watts mentioned that this is a virus that isn't as good as infecting the lung tissue as it is at infecting the upper respiratory tissue, which is why it's a lot more like a common cold in many people. So we aren't seeing as many people, for example, on ventilators in the ICU. Our hospital numbers are reasonably stable. The problem is several fold. One is that even if you get it and it's quote unquote mild, it still can be a miserable infection. Um, you know, you can lose your lot, your sense of smell, your sense of taste. And we don't really know whether something called long COVID, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, which is when you get over the initial infection, but you have persistent fatigue, brain fog, sometimes palpitations, um, a whole bunch of things. You can have pulmonary symptoms, whether that's going to turn out to be common at all with Omicron. So our advice, of course, is don't get it if you can help it. How do you not get it? You avoid it exactly as we've just been saying, and, and Dr. Benoit said, um, and Jasmine said, you really do want to be fully vaccinated. Now, the CDC still defines fully vaccinated as having a primary series. Primary series is defined as two shots of either mRNA vaccine, the Pfizer or the Moderna, or a single J&J &J or Janssen vaccine. So if you've had those, you are considered fully vaccinated. Most people on top of those have now gone ahead and gotten a booster if you really want to optimize your protection. And why is that? Because we're getting a very good sense that the protection afforded by these vaccines probably on average lasts about four to five to six months at the outside. That's why we started seeing so many people get breakthrough infections even before Omicron came on board, right? We still had Delta infections in the fall and we had several people who'd gotten vaccinated, finished their series in, you know, in, in sort of the spring um, and then were about six months out, October, and started to get um, breakthrough infections. Those are almost always quote unquote mild. And again, I don't want to um, oversell the mildness because I don't want to get them. I don't want anybody to get them if they can avoid it. So getting vaccinated, really your first line of defense. The second line of defense is isolation. Um, you know, there have been quite a lot of discussions about what that should look like, how long should it be, and in general, where we've settled is that after you get a positive test, 
and if you're asymptomatic, you count day zero as that positive test, or if you develop symptoms, you count day zero as the day you develop symptoms, um, five days. So you really want to have a minimum of five days where you're not at risk of infecting other people. Um, you don't necessarily need a test at the end of five days. I know there's a lot of practice discussion about that, particularly in athletics, where people are often using that five-day test as a gateway to get back into sport. That's a separate topic, and we can talk about that a little bit if you want. But in general, if you feel really well for at least 24 hours, no fever, no cough, nothing that would suggest you are infectious at five days, you are good to go. So that's a really important uh, prong of our prevention and management control approach. The third thing I'll just mention before um, handing it over to Dr. Judd is um, uh, masks. A lot, um, lot of controversy and discussion about masks. On the one hand, you have people who are saying we should ship N95s out to everybody in the world or in the country. Um, N95s, remember, are the masks that we wear when we don't want to be exposed to people who have tuberculosis, really infectious, infectious diseases. Um, they are the gold standard for preventing the acquisition of airborne or droplet transmitted viruses. Does everybody really need an N95? Again, it's that kind of balance between a perfect world. Um, yeah, if we all had N95s and we all wore them um, all the time, we probably would shut down transmission of this virus momentarily. That is completely unrealistic for many reasons, right? So. Our advice, and I suspect what the CDC is going to say when they do clarify this, I understand they're going to clarify it soon, um, is that any mask is better than no mask. Um, any mask that you wear needs to cover your nose and your mouth. If you have the best N95 in, your, in the world and it's hanging off your chin, that is not going to protect you and it's not going to protect me. Um, and we have some fantastic really good cloth masks that fit like a glove and are very dense. So remember, the three parameters I think about for masks are the density of the material, and that's why N95s are called that because they prevent 95% of particulate matter getting into your nostrils. So the density of the material, um, the fit is very important. You don't want to have leaky sides, which is why surgical masks are not necessarily always protecting us from Omicron. And then the comfort right? You want to be able to wear this in places where you are going to have substantial exposure. Is going into a coffee shop for two minutes to pick up your coffee a substantial exposure? And should you worry about getting COVID? I would worry about Omicron everywhere, but remember the CDC defines close contact as 15 minutes in a 24-hour period within six feet of an infected person. And they have not changed that for Omicron. It could be three, five minute periods, but 15 minutes is what we're talking about. The last thing um, I will just mention is treatment. Um, the other reason I really don't want you to get Omicron, and I just got an email that really, really emphasizes this, is if you are unvaccinated and you get Omicron and you get sick, and we have nothing to treat you with if you're not sick enough to get in the hospital. So uh, let me say that again, we have nothing to treat Omicron with except IV remdesivir, which is a drug we've been using since the very, very beginning of the pandemic. There are two pills now that are approved. We don't have access to them yet. There is now only one monoclonal antibody that works. And I can tell you, we're gonna get six doses of that this week to last us two weeks. So that is paltry and very disturbing. And um, the best way to not be in a situation where you're faced with a serious illness or your loved ones are faced with a serious illness is to just not get infected. So vaccination, masks, isolation uh, to the extent you can. And I really wanna thank everybody for doing an incredible job on campus. I, I've been amazed at how masked people have been in this current uh, wave. Um, so. Thank you. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Judd. Thank you, Dr. Marazzo. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we know about the epidemiology of um, SARS-CoV-2 and how that might change a little bit with Omicron. And the first is transmission. A lot of people don't think about the basics of, of transmission when they're thinking about an infectious disease because we've been living in panic mode for so long with COVID-19. 
But the basics of transmission are, number one, you have to come in contact with an infected individual. And, and given that the individual is infected, the type of activity that you do when you're in contact with that individual matters. For example, if you're sitting in a classroom listening to a professor and you're masked, that's what we call an extremely low transmission activity. We have data from UAB, we've been monitoring since fall of 2020, how likely people are to um, become infected with COVID if they're sitting next to someone in a classroom. And basically the odds are, are very low, down to zero. We haven't had any examples of transmission in the classroom at UAB. Our data is backed up by data from the airlines. The airlines probably do the best contact tracing in the nation. Um, they've had a lot of federal money to do that since the beginning. And they are able to look and see who's sitting around a passenger when they find out that somebody's COVID positive and they can do the contact tracing to see who becomes COVID positive afterwards. Again, very little transmission on airplanes, including when you're sitting at the gate. And most people say, well, that's because airlines turn their air over so much. They only do that when they're flying. When you're sitting at the gate, when you're boarding, when you're moving back and forth on the plane, you're not getting that same air turnover. And yet we still see very little transmission in that setting. The third place, and this is most recent and it actually is with Omicron data, where we've seen transmission in an uh, environment where people are seated next to each other has been in auditoriums. New York City and other places across the US began um, bringing out musicals and uh, theater, ballets again back in the fall. Well, New York did that right in the middle of their Omicron surge and they collected a lot of data on, on their Broadway reopening. They didn't have any uh, examples of transmission in the audience and the audience was fully masked. They also had to be vaccinated to attend but no transmission in the audience, even though the performers often did have some examples of, of transmission that the contact tracers were able to find, but the performers weren't wearing masks. So again, we've got three great sources that show that if your activity is a light activity where you're passively sitting next to someone wearing a mask, it's a very low transmission setting. Settings that are a little higher transmission, those are gonna be settings where you're generating a lot of air. Maybe you're exercising vigorously, or you're singing, or you're yelling because you're in a loud, crowded environment and you don't have a mask on, that's actually going to be what we call a high transmission setting, particularly if you're within six feet of someone else not wearing a mask. So it's critical that we think about transmission, um, where you are and, and how, um, whether or not the person next to you is wearing a mask. Another thing I wanna tell you today is that herd immunity might not be possible with this virus. Um, it looks like with SARS-CoV-2, this particular coronavirus uh, may be like other coronaviruses where we get this kind of cyclic immunity. You get sick from the infection, you develop immunity, and then that immunity may wane over time. This is very normal for other coronaviruses. Um, as, as a community of infectious disease and epidemiologists, we were really hoping that this particular virus would um, develop lasting immunity in the body, but it may be that it's a little bit cyclic. That just means that we have to manage it slightly differently. It means the virus is likely to be endemic is the word that we use. You may have seen that word. It's a fancy epidemiology word that just means it's going to be with us forever. Um, where it'll have peaks and valleys that, that kind of ebb and flow, then we have to manage accordingly as we, we have those surges. We're in one of those surges right now. We do know though that right now it's more mild. Um, here in, in Alabama, I tend to look at local trends rather than national trends. We know that our hospitalization rate is roughly one third of what it was during the Delta wave. And the Delta wave was lower than the wave before that. So we're seeing few people, pe fewer people winding up in the hospital given the high rate of cases. So let's talk a little bit about cases because that's what you're reading about. And that's probably what's scaring you today. We're having explosive case growth in Jefferson County. That's exactly what we're seeing. It's, it's what we were thinking what we would happen when Omicron came. Many of the people who are testing positive don't have any symptoms at all. And that's another tricky thing with management because it makes it tough to know uh, if you don't have symptoms, whether or not it's safe for you to be around other people. That's why we recommend widespread masking, no matter whether you have symptoms or not. What's gonna happen in the future? Well, it looks like the peak of this surge is going to hit in the next seven to 14 days. Probably going to hit in Jefferson County sooner than it hits the rest of Alabama. 
we actually experienced the surge here in Jefferson County about five days ahead of the rest of the state. So we'll likely peak before the rest of the state. In fact, there are already some early indicators that we're nearing the peak. It's expected to peak at around 2,500 to 4,000 hospitalizations a day. It's much more difficult to estimate what the cases will be because we don't have access to testing for everybody. Um, as you know, tests are sold out at the CS and Walmart. I uh, wanted to let folks that we are under count. And so there's a good chance we're in fact there than what we're actually able to observe. So be careful, wear your mask. You heard Dr. Morazzo say that the mask is fairly safe. That's a great way, whether it's cloth or N95. And with that, I'll pass it over to Dr. Faircloth. Thank you, Dr. Judd. Good afternoon, Blazers. Let me congratulate and thank all of you for your amazing effort, resiliency and compliance shown over the course of this pandemic, truly amazing. Student health continues to be available to provide the comprehensive primary care services that you have come to expect, including full service primary care, telehealth services, comprehensive women's health, sports medicine with a dedicated sports medicine clinic, a dedicated sexual health clinic in partnership with the UAB Division of Infectious Diseases, a dedicated eye care clinic in partnership with UAB Eye Care and the School of Optometry, mental health services with an on-site psychiatrist and a mental health nurse practitioner, an immunization clinic, including flu and COVID vaccines, a medical clearance department, an insurance department that helps administer the student health insurance project, dietitian services, athletic training services in collaboration with University Recreation, and we also provide an on-site uh, lab and radiology service. We're open Monday through Thursday, 8 to 5, and on Friday, 9 to 5, and we're open through lunch on all of those days. We are an appointment-based clinic. You can web book your appointments, or you can call 205-934-3580. You can web book through the patient portal, you can access that through our webpage at www.uab.edu forward slash students forward slash health. Specific to COVID, telehealth appointments are available for the initial evaluation of COVID concerns or, or other issues. But particularly if you are symptomatic, you can get your initial evaluation uh, through telehealth. And these are also web bookable. We will certainly see you in person if you prefer, even on the initial visit. Or if we determine you need further evaluation or testing, we'll certainly ask you to come in to be seen in person. If you are coming in as a walk-in, you will at least at minimum be triaged by an RN. But if you are going to walk in, we ask that you please call ahead if you have any fever, cough, or uh, other respiratory symptoms to let us know that you're coming. For COVID reporting, we ask all students with symptoms or a potential COVID exposure to immediately complete the Student Health Service COVID survey, which is available through your patient portal. Again, you can access through our webpage. You will receive instructions immediately upon completion of this initial survey that defines your next actions. And Student Health will then continue to follow you daily throughout the period of your isolation or quarantine. Please isolate or quarantine immediately upon developing symptoms or a potential exposure until you receive further evaluation and are cleared by student health. Student health is aligning with the most current CDC guidance for the timelines for isolation and quarantine that you heard from Dr. Morazzo, and that is a five-day minimum for both. You will receive individualized guidance around clearance from your student health services COVID team, usually from an RN or a clinical provider. Once you complete this initial survey, you will receive a daily survey to complete through your portal. And on day five, you will be reevaluated for potential clearance. For potential exposures, we will assist you in determining if this was a true exposure and if you really need quarantine or not. There is, as you heard earlier, a limited role for antigen testing at day five for isolated students, but this is again individualized to need. Very important and as per CDC guidance, if you are cleared on day six to return to activities on campus, 
it's essential that you continue to mask in all areas where you're around other folks, both on and off campus on days six through 10, and to continue to space at least six feet while you're eating on day six through 10. But also remember, we continue on this campus to have a mask mandate for indoor. So even beyond day 10, even if you feel well, it's required that you continue to mask beyond day 10. We also provide COVID vaccines within the immunization clinic, both Pfizer and Moderna, and we also offer boosters. If you've not yet been vaccinated, we certainly encourage you to consider vaccinating, and we're here to help you with that. If you're vaccinated and you've not shared that information with student health, we encourage you to please upload that documentation again to your patient portal, and it's a very easy process. We also offer appointment-based free in-house point of care rapid COVID testing, both antigen and PCR both based platforms. Most of this rapid testing is uh, reserved for symptomatic students, but we're also offering asymptomatic testing in collaboration with Quest Labs. These are PCR based tests that usually result within 24 to 48 hours as these have to be sent to Quest Labs for processing. Rapid antigen testing of asymptomatic students is available as circumstances dictate need for a rapid test, and that occasionally does happen. I also report all spaces that we're aware of where students have been positive and have been on campus, such as a classroom or lab to facilities every evening, and then these spaces undergo enhanced cleaning that same evening. So again, thank you. And I will now pass to Mark Booker, Executive Director of Housing and Dining. Thank you, Dr. Faircloth. Uh, good afternoon, Blazers. I'd like to join what Dr. Faircloth said and thank you for your efforts over the last two years within student housing, as well as any of you who have joined us in dining in the dining venues on campus. You've all done a remarkable job of being cooperative and being respectful and trying to help us reduce the spread of, of this virus on campus. And so we are all very appreciative of your efforts so far and ask for your continued ongoing patience and cooperation within housing and, and the classrooms and dining venues on campus. Some of what I'm going to say today is a little bit repetitive of what others have said, but uh, just want to kind of go over it again so that um, we're sure that you have the information. If you experience symptoms, please get tested. And we encourage our housing residents on campus to quarantine and isolate off campus if it's practical to do so. Um, and if not, we do have space on campus for you to isolate. Uh, all of our guidelines are posted on our website, and sometimes those change and vary a little bit, so I didn't want to get into the minutia of that today uh, and take up an inordinate amount of time. But if you'll visit our website at uab.edu forward slash housing and click on the current students tab, uh, you can find information out about the most up-to-date and current COVID guidelines as it relates to isolation and quarantine, vaccinated, unvaccinated, things like that. If you, uh, once you isolate, uh, we ask that you not return to your room until you're cleared by student health to do that um, on campus. You should also, as Dr. Faircloth mentioned, continue wearing your mask indoors and socially distance from even your roommates if possible, um, in those cases for days six through 10, as you continue to um, convalesce from the virus. In an effort to better manage our dining options for the fall, we have altered some of our hours. So for a full schedule of those within the dining areas, we ask that you visit uab.edu forward slash dining. And we have all of those outlined as well. I hope that all of you remain healthy and again, appreciate your ongoing efforts to help us maintain and uh, continue to keep each other safe on campus. If you have specific concerns, please don't hesitate to email us at studenthousing at uab.edu or uabdining at uab.edu. So again, thanks for attending today and your attention. Go Blazers and now I'll turn it over to Dr. Angela Stowe with Student Counseling and Wellness. Dr. Stowe. Thank you, Mark, and good afternoon, Blazers. Um, it's a lot of information I know today. Um, a lot of 
things that we want to assure you that um, we got you through this and what we can provide to you for support and what you can expect as much as we can as the semester is progressing, but it is a lot of information and it's a lot to digest. So I just want to take a moment to remind us how to breathe. Um, and so if everybody, I invite you to just take a deep breath in and take that in through your nose and hold that air, just pull it into your belly deep inside. Hold that for a moment. And then I want you to breathe out slowly through your mouth, almost like you're blowing out of a straw. I want you to give your body just a minute to relax as much as you can as we're absorbing all that's going on right now and managing how we navigate um, a, a daily changing landscape as we are having to pivot and recalibrate and understand how we're going to move forward and have a successful semester. There's some really important things I want to remind you to do that can help you take care of yourselves and really take you back to basics right now, because this is this is sometimes the things we need to remind ourselves of most. The first thing is to remember to drink lots of water, hydrate yourself well. Your bodies and your brains are working in overdrive right now to make decisions, to take care of others, to take care of yourselves, and to stay on your track um, and to pursue your goals and to be as successful as possible. So drink lots of water. We really, really need to take care of our bodies and our brains right now. In that same vein, sleep. Sleep is really important. And sometimes sleep is hard when you're anxious and when you're stressed or when there's a lot on your mind. But as you can, be sure to give your body the rest that it needs away from distractions. Set your phone aside, set your tasks aside so that you truly can allow your body to repair itself and restore itself so that you can get up in the morning and do the things you need to do during the day. Stay connected with your people, um, with your supports, check in with each other, um, check in with those that you love and that you care about and allow them to check in with you um, and let them know how you're doing and lean on those that provide you support that's so important right now. Ask for what you need. There's a lot of questions about how things are gonna work this semester with absences and quarantining and isolating and what may be going on. And so be sure to self-advocate, ask for what you need. And if you aren't sure, reach out to the resources on campus that can help get you connected with what you need because we are here for you. And practice compassion for others, of course, offer and extend grace as we're all doing the best that we can but also please be compassionate with yourself. Um, give yourself a break, be forgiving of yourself, um, give yourself a minute to just kind of um, be off the hook because there's a lot going on and you're doing the best you can too. And then remember to breathe. Check yourself, are, are you breathing? A lot of times we hold our breath and we aren't remembering to breathe when there's so much going on. We have some key resources available for you. Um, student Counseling Services continues to be here. You're welcome to schedule an appointment by going to your patient portal and, and setting up a time to meet with a counselor. We can help you with some strategies, with some coping, with some support um, to help you process and cope and work on um, however you're impacted right now. I also want to remind you about our Be Well UAB app. This is our hub for employees and for students of mental health resources. If you're needing some guidance in developing a self-care plan, you can do that through the app and, and have kind of a daily check-in with yourself through our journal, as well as the self-care activities that are on there. There are mindfulness meditation and yoga videos. There are even some breathing videos to help you slow down for two or three minutes in your day that you can use um, that were developed by our own folks here at UAB. We also have a platform called Together All that we offer to all students that's free as a UAB student that 24 seven can connect you with other students for mental health, emotional support so that you're not alone and that you can connect with others. And then I wanna make sure you remember about our UAB CARES resources. 
These are our suicide prevention resources, and we have our centralized hub at our UAB CARES website that at any point in time you're worried about somebody or you yourself um, need to connect to resources, we can make sure you know how to do that. We can also make sure you know how to help someone else as well. So my main takeaway message is, you know, we are strong and we are resilient. We have shown that over the past couple of years, and it continues to be a journey um, that we're going through together. And there's some days that it's easier to remember that than others, but resources are here and we are here to help you through that. Remember to take care of yourselves as you're taking care of each other and let us know how we can support you. Um, with that, I'll now pass it along to uh, Dr. Jones. Sure. Um, similar to everyone else, Happy New Year and welcome back, Blazers. My name is John Jones, and I have the pleasure of serving as your Vice President for Student Affairs. I trust that you had a restful break and are ready to finish the academic year strong. I will be incredibly brief so we can get to the Q&A portion of this webinar. As the Vice President, I have the privilege of leading and working with talented, passionate and dedicated professionals committed to the university mission of fostering student success. A significant part of our role is to, brought, to provide, excuse me, the students with a uh, comprehensive, integrated student experience, which embraces learning, personal and social responsibilities, leadership development, healthy lifestyles, and the appreciation of diverse ideas, cultures, and people. Prior to the beginning of 2022 and before the start of the spring semester, we had hoped to alleviate some of our campus COVID-19 protocols. However, due to the recent Omicron variant and the surge of positive cases, we not only continued our current effective protocols, but we also suspended in-person student events. The suspension is based on the guidance from our public health, infectious disease, and healthcare experts. As you know, UAB makes health and safety decisions based on science and data. The suspension of in-person student events was because of we were beginning, we were at the beginning of a substantial, a substantial surge of positive cases, and we observed a significant increase in the number of students testing positive. The goal of this additional step is to mitigate the surge and slow the spread of positive cases within the student community. As you know, and as you have heard from Dr. Morazzo, Dr. Faircloth, Dr. Judd, them, as well as our other experts, they guide us. We will continue to monitor, monitor COVID and the impact it has on our protocols that we have in place. Additionally, we will alter our approach when they deem it's appropriate and safe. Until that time, until that time, we appreciate your diligence and adhering to our safety protocols. In closing, as you know at UAB, we are committed to excellence, accountability, and to being student-centered in everything that we do. Our students and those who support UAB deserve no less. We will continue to work to provide you opportunities for new experiences, for achievement, as well as in-person engagement. Ultimately, we'll get back to that. So, Again, we wish you a great new year, a, a strong beginning to the start of 2022, and we ask that you continue to stay safe. Go Blazers. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Rosie so we can do the Q&A portion of this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Um, as the, <clears throat> the town hall has taken place, our experts and our leaders have jumped in to answer many of the questions that have come in. So we actually don't have a lot of questions. Um, uh, so if you have a question, I'm just going to take a moment and please feel free to submit. Um, I have a couple of questions from the pre-submitted list that I wanted to give um, a few folks the opportunity to answer. So one of the questions, and this is for Dr. Barnes, um, is the school still providing CARES Act money to help with tuition books, um, et cetera? Thank you, Rosie. Uh, yes. And uh, now that spring aid is dispersed, we'll begin reviewing student financial data for eligibility, um, award criteria that we'll be looking for as we prioritize the remaining higher ed emergency relief funds include students with past due balances that have previously qualified for HERP assistance. So students, if you think that you fall into this category, uh, please contact the Office of Financial Aid 
and we'll be happy to discuss this with you. Great, thank you. Um, another pre-submitted question, uh, Dr. Faircloth, um, what is UAB doing to ramp up testing, provide at-home testing, and provide proper masks to students who cannot afford them? And so in student health, as, as mentioned earlier, we are now uh, providing both rapid in-house um, and will have results within 30 minutes to an hour for both of these tests, mostly for symptomatic students. Um, that's both PCR and antigen based, and we're doing all we can to keep that supply chain intact. We're also partnering with Quest, an outside commercial laboratory for both. They can do asymptomatic or symptomatic testing um, and making sure that we have another supply chain that we can send tests to if we need and trying to do all of our asymptomatic testing outside of student health and partner with Quest so that we will continue to have enough for our students who are sick. At home test, I'm not sure what the, I know that there's a supply chain issue with that right now. And I'm, I'm reading that there may be in the near future that you'll be able to go online and order from some place in, from the federal government tests that are free. I, I don't have any more information about that yet. Um, we don't have those sort of tests here. We have different sorts of tests. If you show up at student health without a mask, we will give you, um, we'll give you a mask here. Right. All right. I see that um, some of our experts are responding to the couple of outstanding questions that we have here, but just wanted to ask the panelists, did anybody want to follow up verbally from some of the responses that they've dropped in the Q&A? I'd like to speak a little bit about the student events. Um, I know that Dr. Jones took this up. I want to reiterate that this is for the month of January and that we'll reassess to see whether or not that needs to be extended. So this is not for the entire term. The other thing I wanna um, talk a little bit about is the difference between what he talked about as student events and what we consider to be academic student events. So for example, service learning or a play that's part of a class or um, music performance that's part of a class, those events will continue to be done, but we'll be asking people to make sure that they follow safety protocols while, while they're doing them. Dr. Jones, did you wanna add anything there? Sorry for that, Pam, because I was in the process of responding to a question. Oh, sorry. Um, and certainly, um, um, as you indicated, we're only looking until the end of January so we can resume these events, given if our experts give us the um, guidance to do so. Again, um, as Dr. Judd indicated, um, this Omicron variant should peak within 10 to 12 days, 10 to 14 days. Um, so if you count forward, um, it should decrease quickly after that. If you look forward, then that gives us the opportunity to resume um, in-person events. Yeah, and I was going to add one more thing. I was getting the dreaded internet connection unstable. Um, so I wanted to make sure folks could hear what I was saying. We're really looking at the peak coming in about seven to 14 days, give or take. We'll see where in Jefferson County, but then we should be coming back down the other side. February is looking much better than January. Um, if, if we hold the way New York City held, if we hold the way that South Africa held. So we're really hoping that this is very similar, that we're experiencing actually some of the most rapid growth right now um, and, and starting to see the, the turn toward the, the downhill side. Thank you. We've had a question come in asking about commencement. Is there a specific date um, we can look to by which the final determination will be made about in-person commencement, uh, Dr. Benoit? As soon as we can. Um, we, we continue to consult with our experts. And uh, even though I would like to know today or next week, um, they provide the best, um, the best advice about when we feel like we could make that decision. So I can't, I can't put an exact date on it. I would say continue to watch the commencement website. Uh, we'll send out a note to those students who are scheduled to graduate and who have registered to graduate, letting them know when that decision gets made. Then a follow-up question, as the search worsens, at what point would UAB decide to switch to remote learning? 
that's always a really tricky question. Um, and I can tell you that the metrics we look at, we look at hospitalizations, we look at rate of hospitalization. So the number of people that wind up in the hospital per case, it's not just the total, it's also what that rate is if we saw a change in the rate. And then we monitor uh, the cases to, to make sure that the cases are um, holding with the model, indicating that it might be peaking. So it's, it's really a, a tricky question because managing the epidemic requires looking at multiple types of data. It, it could change on the dime. The, the virus could mutate again. It could become um, where more folks are winding up in the hospital. So basically every week we look at those metrics and we, we make sure that they're going in the direction anticipated and, and not moving off course. Thank you. Uh, another question, will week, weekly rapid testing be required? No, let's see. Dr. Dr. Watts, do you want to respond? <laughs> or no, Dr. Fair? It won't be required. And one thing is I've listened, I want to reiterate is that most of the patients in the hospital and by far most of the patients in the ICU are unvaccinated. So that is an indicator that vaccination is critically important to protect yourself and others that you come in contact with. And so we can't emphasize that enough. That's the most powerful tool we have to beat down this pandemic. And so take advantage of that at every possible opportunity. All right. We don't have any other questions. I'll give it a moment to see if anybody has any additional follow-up questions. Dr. Judd, I see that you're responding to the um, N95 mask question. Do you want to just verbally respond? Oh, sure. The um, So from the data standpoint, the data that's come out on masking, it actually is very clear that um, just asking people to wear a mask, but without telling them it has to be an N95 or it has to be a surgical mask, but just the act of asking people to wear a mask reduces transmission in classroom settings by over 70%. So I think a lot of times people get into what's um, you know masking perfection. Oh, it has to be that exact mask that fits perfectly that they're talking about in the news. But there, the scientific evidence demonstrates that it's not, that's not the case at all. We get a huge benefit just from asking people to wear a mask. Um, so that just shows you that that reduction matters. So a follow-up question is, is if there's no rapid testing, how will students be protected from asymptomatic people? The mask, the mask is the most important thing. Um, universal masking ensures that even folks that are asymptomatic uh, it's less likely that they spread particles. And then if you have a mask on yourself, it's less likely that you'll be infected. Great, thank you. Um, okay, a question about um, in-person labs. Would UAB move in-person labs where students and instructors have to be in close contact to an online setting before they would move lecture classes? And what would the community transmission threshold for that look like? So we faced this question earlier with labs and classrooms as well. And what we found was that in a lot of the lab settings, there were already ways that they could mitigate um, by scheduling different times people were in the labs, by making sure that there are masks. Most of those individuals in the labs are already wearing masks, so that was good as well. So again, we look at the data to determine what kind of recommendations should be made. If we found, for example, high transmissibility rates in the labs that were much higher for some reason than in classrooms, uh, then we might make a different kind of decision regarding labs. So far, there hasn't been any evidence that suggests that that would be the case. We go back to what Dr. Judd said, if you're doing low level activities and not singing, not shouting, not, and that's typically not what's being done in a research lab. Um, those, are, those are very low transmission kinds of settings. So I don't anticipate that we would have a different decision for different contexts. Okay. Um, William Lynn asks, I would like to ask about any extra date for campus move-in if we did online orientation due to an absence from the on-campus orientation on the 7th. Is there another date I must wait for 
or would I be able to come to campus at any time? Not sure who's the best person to answer that. Just with us, William, if you don't mind, and uh, let us know when you'd like to come and we'll make arrangements for that to happen. So thanks for the question. Right. Um, Dr. Marazzo, I see you jumping in trying to answer this question. So maybe if you wanted to answer verbally. Um, sure. So yeah, thanks. So the question is about the relative efficacy of N95s versus surgical masks. Um, I mean, if you look at a surgical mask, you can see that it's relatively loose and you've got points of entry on largely the sides, right, which are not really snug against the contour of your face. Um, so they are great for things that are coming at you like this, like large droplets that people might be sneezing at you, but not for the stealthy kinds of things that we're talking about with airborne transmission, such as, so unfortunately, the Omicron variant. So you're correct. They are not the best for Omicron. The best things for Omicron are the N95 equivalents or cloth masks that are dense and really fit very well. There is no clear comparative study that looks at the transmission of Omicron comparing both of those two types of things. Again, remember all cloth masks are not made the same. Some are clearly better than others. And I'm sure many of you have seen the really good ones um, that some people wear that really fit like a glove um, and, and cover your face and can be actually as hard to breathe in um, if you're running up and down stairs, for example, as a classic N95. So um, I think you can protect yourself certainly by using N95s. They are available. Um, you know, they're they're an option. Um, but if an N95 is not comfortable or not available to you, then I strongly encourage you to use a really well-fitting uh, cloth mask that is as dense as possible. Thank you. We are near the end of the hour, so I want to give uh, Dr. Benoit and Dr. Watts um, just a moment here to say some wrap-up comments. So, Dr. Benoit. So, once again, I want to reiterate that we're really proud of you. We know that this has been difficult. We know that it's a, a hard time. It's a it's a very strange time to be going to uh, college. And yet you've done it. Um, we've had people graduate. We've had people win incredible honors. We've had you excel in ways that, that we just were, were excited to see for you. And so we wanna to continue to work with you to make sure that your dreams come true, your academic dreams are successful. Anything we can do to do that, we're trying to accomplish. Thank you, Dr. Watts. Well, I think is, you can tell we want you to be as informed as possible and we want you to have a safe and successful semester and we will do everything within our power to ensure that and we will always make the best data-driven decisions based on our public health and infectious disease experts advice so be well get vaccinated if you're not wear your mask diligently and let's all stay safe. Thank you all for being here and we hope this has been helpful. Thank you. Thanks everybody.